Oi oi, it's your boy, Jack Slack, Fights Gone By podcast, consuming a lovely hot cup of Earl Grey, Earl Grey, hot, and turning it into sizzling hot content in your ears, because you are in need of content. God knows I am, because there's fuck all going on now. Uh, it was going to be a very exciting few weeks of fights leading up to Tony versus Habib, and now everything has gone to shit. Um... I suppose that's our news today, but it's going to be kind of impossible to run through all the twists and turns that were going on in the few days since last we spoke. Uh, At at one point, the plan was to move all the London fights onto the Cage Warriors card, which, as far as I know, is still going ahead, but with no crowd. So that's content for Fight Pass, at least. Um, But fortunately, some of the fighters who desperately wanted to fight on the UK card, who are from the UK, uh, have been able to get their fights moved to um, Cage Warriors and take the fight on their UFC contract, which, you know, as much as I'm not super keen on having all these people get together for the health, you know, the health of the fighters and their teams, it is a a cool way to sort things out. It's nice to see companies working together like that. I mean, Cage Warriors has sort of taken on like a feeder league role for the UFC in recent years, though Ross Houston did just go to Bellator. So that's what's going on with some of the fights from UFC London, because, you know, fuck, you're not going to be able to do a closed door event at the O2, as much as that would be awesome. I would have rung up Bleacher Report or MMA Fighting or whoever and asked to get them to get me a press pass for that. I would love to see a world class fight card with no fans inside the O2. I think that'd be banging. But obviously they weren't going to do that. So they were talking about moving it back to the Apex Center, even though I think it was the governor of Vegas, um, who I assume wears a 10-gallon hat and has six shooters on his belt at all times, uh, said that you're not doing that. You can't have gatherings at the Apex Center anymore either. And uh, the plan was that they were going to fly Leon Edwards out. And this was immediate, This was two days before the travel ban was going to extend to the UK. And they were doing it with sort of an air of, well, we'll get you out here. And then we'll work out what we're going to do from there. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like, how am I going to get back? You know, um, plus all the airlines are going to go broke and we're supposed to feel sorry for them. Get them a nice bailout. If you don't know how things are going in the UK at the moment, let me update you. Um, nothing's cancelled, but everything shouldn't like should be cancelled. The way it's working is that the Tories, being cowards, have told people not to go to pubs and not to go to restaurants and not to congregate, but they aren't going to officially enforce it so that people who own small businesses like pubs and and, uh, restaurants can't claim it on their insurance. So basically, it's a government-prescribed boycott of business because they're a nasty bunch of cunts. That being said, you can still go past the pub and see tons of people in there. And there's there's lots of young people, to be fair. But also, like, if you walk down the town in the middle of the day at the moment, uh, just full of uh, old folks having a good time in lovely weather at the moment. And uh, people just like, yeah, well, we're going to be forcibly shut up in a few weeks time. So let's just make the most of it. All the gyms that I go to are closed. So, you know, I'm just uh, working out what to do with my life. And of course... Dickheads keep buying up all the potatoes and chicken and mince. So can't make any basic food. Have to have like lamb or pork or incredibly rich things or just like ramen noodles. But what we did have going into this was an awesome uh, weekend card. And it was looking it was looking touch and go for a while. I was saying, "Uh oh, I've talked big game about how this is a well matched up card and it, they're going to play out well. I think they were coming they were coming close to the record for decisions entering the main card and then a load of interesting stuff happened. I mean not not that the undercard was uninteresting but obviously people like their finishes. So this was a closed door card in Brasilia which was super weird and played out very strangely because you could hear Michael Bisping shout, "Oh, he's hurt." And you could also hear him like in the background of the sound from the octagon. So you realise that, oh, there's about 12 people around the cage at any time and the fighters can just hear Michael Bisping shouting, oh, he's hurt. Truly surreal. Um, And it ended up with some very strange uh, happenings, which I think might have been a result of it. Um, You know, in the main event, Kevin Lee tapped to a guillotine choke and then tried to continue afterwards. And I think that's might have been largely influenced by there not being a crowd reacting and, uh, you know, holding you to honesty because they've all seen it. You know, if it's just you 
the other guy and the ref and you think that nobody's seen it you might go oh fuck i'll continue brazilian tap and uh, and get a little bit of a and keep going afterwards but uh the other one was hanato moicano beat uh hadzovic sorry and then wanted to continue fighting because obviously like he was super stoked to get a huge win in front of his hometown and then there was no one in the crowd cheering so you've just got like all that excitement for a fight but none of the blow off of the you know um, rabid audience once you've got your victory it, i mean it played out super weird and there were people talking about it online like maybe that is what's affecting all these people not getting stoppages too you know lots of tame decisions because it's it's like you're in the gym putting in rounds rather than like you're out there as an entertainer uh, because you know a lot of fighters do see themselves as entertainers but let's talk about some of these uh, well we'll start with the top because it was absolutely superb charles Oliveira versus kevin lee we talked about this last week. We were saying, like, the the thing that I was concerned about, and then when I listened to Heavy Hands, the thing that the Heavy Hands boys were concerned about too, was, um, you know, we all the people heralding Kevin Lee's complete turnaround since going to TriStar, which was, you know, less than half a round of <laughs> what you saw of it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that's bad. He, knocking out Gregor Gillespie is awesome, but I was there going, you know, hang on. It's the start of a change. It's not necessarily... Uh, you, you know the conclusion of a change and it, it might not all be positive um but the the thing was that tristar tend to produce sort of one size fits all game plans for jabby wrestling athletes and it gets a little bit too clean and i was saying right in the run-up to this i think he might try and fight too clean and i think the kind of fight that he could win against Oliveira is one where he gets in Oliveira's face from the get-go and just takes him down and tries to smash him in the guard um or smash him along the fence where Oliveira had a lot of trouble with felder as it turned out, that seemed to sort of be the case. You know, Lee was trying to jab and use the jab to keep Oliveira off him. And Oliveira was not respecting the jab enough to stay off him. You know, if you're landing a good jab for every three good strikes he throws and he's not just throwing jabs, it's, it's not a very good, um, you know, that's not a winning proposition. Even in a pure boxing contest, you know, you need, the jab is an attritive, uh, 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 an attritive weapon, a weapon of attrition, rather, um, but you also need to have a good right hand to stop the guy coming forward. And that could be a good right hand or the chin just to say, hey, look, I will crack you if you open up wildly. Um, a good right hand to the solar plexus to just say, slow the fuck down, settle down, mate. Uh, and also the ability to, to move into the clinch and tie up. And I don't think Lee was really doing any of those very well. He threw a couple of right hands later on, but um, he, he should have got to that early and just said, you know, here's the right hand. I will force it down your face if you step in on me. Whereas he was trying to box cleanly while sort of being run ragged. You know, he was circling with his back to the fence for most of the fight when it was standing. Oliveira was coming out, you know, jumping kicks. Um, but, uh, you know, as much as Oliveira did do some wild stuff, I thought he looked incredibly good. Yeah, I thought he looked very sharp. His jab was on point. He was moving his head just a little bit between all his um, punches and and between any of his steps in lots of feints with both the hips and the shoulders so fainting kicks and fainting punches and you know not just like spazzy swinging too you know he was really uh looking a lot sharper you know i think whoever he's working with that's been working on his hands has done a really good job he's still standing very tall but he takes a shot well he was also avoiding a lot of shots which i was very impressed by uh he's using the threat of the clinch and the tie-ups to to make himself more um effective in the striking realm and for whatever reason, you know, we used to say that, well, I certainly used to say, in fact, I think I said it in the last episode, I'd say I've got concerns about his chin, but he just took Kevin Lee's right hands right on the face. Lee's a good puncher. Um, and, and, you know, Lee's got that Sonny Liston thing where even if he's giving up inches of height to you, he's punching straight through your head because his arms are like twice the length they should be. So, yeah, I thought Oliveira's striking looked very, very good here. I thought the grappling was absolutely superb, and there's a lot of good grappling on this card. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, it's a Brazil card. But no, most of the Brazil cards don't have grappling this good on. Um, Charles Oliveira, obviously one of the most active uh, bottom players in the sport. He has a little bit of the Frank Mears, which is uh, if you can stifle him out, he will waste a lot of energy creating openings or creating opportunities and then sort of tire and sit still for a bit and you can hit him and that's uh, i think that happened a little bit in close guard with was it felder but it, it was happening in the second third round of this one too but the first round he was just a fucking blur of activity he shoots a great overhook triangle which is you know a basic technique but very hard to do you know consistently against good people and he was you know every time kevin lee sat still postured down in his closed guard 
Oliveira is going, no, I'm going to, I'm going to triangle you if you don't do something. Uh, and that even if you're not getting the triangle and he stacks up, it stacks up into you. You can roll over the shoulder. You can come up on the single. It, it's making stuff happen when he wants to just sort of sit in your guard and keep you flat. Lots of leg entanglements. And this really hammers home like what I, we often say about leg entanglements. Uh, while they did change the grappling game, you haven't seen a lot of heel hooks going off in MMA. Um, you don't know. You haven't seen an uh, a, a big uptick in that. But Charles Oliveira uses leg entanglements almost every fight. And I think he's got one leg attack submission, and that was a calf slicer. So, you know, it's, it's really important because the threat of you tearing someone's heel, or you know, tearing someone's knee apart, uh, makes the move, and that keeps the action flowing. And he was doing a lot of that. There was some really interesting stuff he'd used. He used, um, at one point, he entered a Y guard, which is where you've got one leg on the shoulder and the other basically like a, the scissor sweep sort of position but on the other the opponent's other thigh um so it's like wedged in there keeping the space and you can come up on uh, on a sweep by getting up to your hand and doing like a turkish get up or or you can do what Oliveira did which was uh kick the opponent away a bit and then loop your your top leg over and he started attacking the saddle and then from the saddle he went for the inside heel hook uh, oh no he he was trying to work on the inside heel hook and uh Lee rolled and as Lee rolled belly down, uh, Oliveira also went belly down and switched to that belly down 50-50 or backside 50-50, I think Ryan Hall calls it. Think of the position that um, Lachlan Giles finished all those dudes with in ADCC and uh, Ryan Hall finished BJ Penn. You know, it's a 50-50, but you're facing down and the opponent is going to try and like step back into the 50-50 without getting their knee blown apart. And mad respect to Kevin Lee because he, he went through all of that and I was watching it going... Fucking hell, those transitions are sharp, and he was still getting out of all the uh, all the attacks. And that backside 50-50 stuff all, all uh, links up with the calf slicer, which was already uh, a favourite transition of Oliveira. And it, it is a lot of uh, the top Brazilian jiu-jitsu players in their nogi game, they use the calf slicer a lot. You will very, very rarely see a calf slicer submission, but by passing the leg over um and uh buckling the opponent's leg to do it you can come up on the back so you see like buchecha does it all the time uh the meows do it basically everyone does, or used to do it until the modern leg lock meta sort of came along and now you see more guys trying the backside 50 50 and things like that but the calf slicer was always money as a position more than as a submission like the Kimura, really. You know, you don't see a lot of Kimura finishes except for Jimmy Crute, but you do see the Kimura used a lot to make guys move, to threaten them, to say, stay on your back or I will tear your arm off when you come up into me. I think um, what I... Returning to the feet, uh, or actually, no, on the subject of the calf slicer, there was a, a couple of occasions where Kevin Lee sort of freed himself, turned back into uh, Oliveira, but Oliveira, he would still have his like leg caught up behind him and you were looking at it going, oh, that's nasty. You know, that's going to be putting a lot of talk on the, on your knee. Um, and he was just dealing with it. You know, his passing still looked fairly good against a guy who's really active from his guard and really re uh, retains his guard well. And you, you know you've got someone um, dead to rights positionally if uh, the guy who does all the submission attempts uh, suddenly is just sitting still holding his arms out and looking at the ref like, are you going to restart this? <laughs> because that's what happened in, was it round two? When Kevin Lee was in the top of half guard and he uh, had the shoulder pressure going in, you know, the shoulder of justice. And he's starting to work with no hands pass. And uh, Oliveira is doing his absolute best to be like, he's not doing anything, ref. <laughs> uh, you know, that guy who up until that point had been constant submission attempts. But returning to the feet, one of the things that I let uh, that I think let Lee down was uh, firstly the lack of the stiff counter right hand, uh, lack of kicking generally. But he was put on the back foot a lot, which sort of uh, limited his ability to do that. But uh, reactive doubles, uh, reactive takedowns. <laughs> I I accidentally wrote reactionary double the other day, and I thought, oh, I wonder what Tim Kennedy's up to right now. But reactive double uh, is you know it's that short level change, knock him over. You can do like the um, Jordan Burroughs style forehead into the chest and double hand reap, you know, sort of double, not even full committed double leg. But it works very well when the opponent's putting the pressure on, ba mainly because if they recklessly apply the pressure, you're going to knock them over. But if they see you doing that, they're going to go, ah, fuck, you know, have to sit back a little bit more. And Lee hit, I think, two really good uh, reactive doubles in the second or third round, uh, second and third round, I think. But um, through the first round, really wasn't doing it very much. 
Now, obviously, the ground game got very uh, wild and wacky for him, but I think the threat of putting the guy on the ground and saying, okay, well, I'll just lay on you. If if you keep walking forward, I'm going to put you on the ground, lay on you and win the round, uh, or, you know, at least win like three minutes of it. Um, If you punish a guy with two minutes stuck on the bottom every time he pushes forward too hard on the feet, you really make him make that decision to, to take a step back. But the um, yeah, loads of cool stuff from Oliveira. The the right uppercut into right straight. The old Arlovsky special. He was timing circling te- uh, spinning techniques as Lee circled around to his uh, around past his lead foot. So he tried a back uh, spinning back fist. I think he tried a wheel kick at one point. Hit him with a back kick to the body. Just really good. W- I mean, it's it's hard for me to sing too many praises for him here. I think the thing is that I was always, um, you know, I see this a lot. It, it kind of it, it t- hacks me off when I see people like. Talking about Ale- uh, Alex, not Alex Oliveira. No, you say whatever you want about him. But it's, it's probably true. Uh, when when people talk about Charles Oliveira and they were talking about the streak he was on, and then someone would go, "Yeah, until he meets someone good," <laughs> and you'd be like, "Hey, don't be a dick." But you'd also be like, "Yeah, well, you are sort of right." You know, he was he'd been murdering guys, but he'd gone on sort of like a, a six fight streak over um, mid tier competition, is what I'd call it. And not really taking that step up. It was like when Neil Magny put together like that eight fight streak or whatever it was. Part of it is facilitated by the fact that you're not just running up through the ranks. They've kept you in the same spot for a while for whatever reason. Uh, Might just be that you're taking all the fights that come up, you know, being like the last minute replacement. Uh, Might just be because they don't really have a plan for you and you don't fit into the title picture. I think with Oliveira, part of it was that he had some hard losses on his record you know uh felder smoked him fairly easy uh i mean there was the frankie edgar one back in the day but like it, it was, it's hard to sell that compared to like justin gaethje uh just knocking out everyone and completely looking completely different almost overnight or you know guys like habib or you know guys with like one loss maybe who have just rebuilt themselves uh and, and it's the lightweight division so you're going to lose out there's a lot of big characters in that division so you're going to lose out to them Especially as they're English speakers and you are not. So anytime you try and trash talk like Conor McGregor or Habib Nurmagomedov or whatever, you're not going to do very well if you if you only speak Portuguese. But, you know, the other thing is that I've always said that the UFC doesn't really know what to do with submission artists. You know, we all agree that it's like one of the most awesome parts of MMA, but the UFC never seems to. Like, they didn't really do very much with Jacare or they struggled to sell Maya. Uh, you know, they put them on these weird local amazonian cards and shit and you're going no that's a really entertaining fighter people who like the sport really like that fighter so maybe you know in in terms of that like the recent run of uh well he i mean he's finished this one with a a guillotine but he was doing most of it with his striking but up until like his last three sorry his last two have been mostly striking um you know he he knocked out both those opponents you know he's got the record for most submissions and he could be running away with it but he knocked out two of his most recent opponents instead um you know it's just nice to see him make the jump he deserves to be in with really good guys now and kevin lee is a really good guy i mean he he does tend to choke you know he's got enormous talent but also this uh tendency to drop off if the fight's not going his way um but yeah Oliveira is in a great spot now i mean you could give him ally Quinta because i could see ally Quinta being difficult for him just based on toughness and difficultness uh, to take down difficulty in being taken down there you go um or you could give him Felder, have the rematch, because it's been two years, three years now. There's people talking about doing him versus Gaethje, and you're like, that would be the worst decision on the part of Justin Gaethje, because he could be hanging, at, he could be holding out for a Conor McGregor or a Dustin Poirier rematch or something like that. You know, well, the Conor McGregor one would be your favourite, because he's, he's not going to get a title shot until like next year, even if Tony versus Habib goes off. Can thank uh, Conor McGregor for making that the most important division, because now basically that's the heavyweight division. You fight once a year if you're the champion. Um, so yeah, that that whole division is just a mess. Uh, it would be. Do you know what would be fun? Oh no, Barbosa's just moved down to featherweight and he's doing something different. I was going to say Edson Barbosa versus Charles Oliveira. That would be fun. Hooker versus Oliveira. That'd be a laugh. I mean, this is the thing. Like, I'm throwing out match matchups that sound great, but. You you can't really not do that in the top 10 of the lightweight division. It is just stacked, and it always has been. Or has been for the longest time, at least. So what else went on this card? I mean, Gilbert Burns versus Damian Meyer was a bit sad. You don't expect me to mull on that too long. It went out down pretty much as you'd expect, because I said immediately before the fight, I was like, if, if Damian Meyer does this at his age against an opponent who is you know so good in his own field even and has other assets to his game, uh, I think this would be probably Jamie Meyer's most impressive win of all 
uh, and then he got knocked out. But, you know, I was impressed how much what, what he was doing in the early going. Um, he did a great little... Uh, he took him to the fence with the over-under, picked up the single on the... picked up the leg on the overside uh, and tilted Burns off the fence and then came back with a crotch grip and picked him up in what... I don't know, like a Sakui Nagi, a scooping throw. But uh, I, I just tweeted, he picked him up by the taint, because he did. Uh, that was a Wade Shallers one. He used to start from referee's position. He'd do a crotch grip and he'd go like, when he was explaining it, he was like, because uh, if he tries to sit out, he'll tear his own nuts off. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a bit. But then that's wrestling in a nutshell. Um, and frankly, that happened in the Johnny Walker versus Nikita Krilov fight. I, my main tweet about that fight was, uh, oil check has a way of wearing on a man. <laughs> Which is a paraphrase of uh, Muhammad Ali. He said that about talking to a man while beating him. He said, has a way of wearing on a man. But I, I like saying that about the oil check. Because if you watch that Krilov versus Walker fight, Krilov's takedowns were shit. And he was like diving for Walker's knees, getting thrown onto the bottom. But he was still fingers in Johnny Walker's hole <laughs> while he was being dragged down. Hanato Moicano versus Demir Hadzovic was just a bit odd. Um, you know, good to see Moicano get back in the win column. I mean, really, like, you know, he's known as a striker. His issues have come from guys who just overwhelmed him on the feet. Um, but he just took the guy down and submitted him quite quickly. And then he wanted to keep fighting. And then in the post-fight, he's like, I'm sorry, I wanted to keep fighting. And Hansevich goes, then you shouldn't have submitted me. <laughs> but he was, like, dead serious. It's so good. Um, yeah, I mean, Moikane, always decent on the ground, but... Well, I suppose this is what he should be pushing. He should be pushing the the roundedness, the jack of all trades, you know, stuff because that's what he can do. He can box up the Brian Ortegas. He can grapple with the the guys who are difficult on the feet, um, and he can you know sort of hang in the other areas with with them too. So uh, yeah, it's just you know I don't know what to make of this fight because I didn't rate Hasvich very highly, and uh, Renato Moicano after this was like, I'm a top ten lightweight. Give me Paul Felder, and I was just thinking, hmm, you know. I'm not super impressed. Now, I'll tell you what would be a great fight for him. Uh, welcoming Michael Chandler to the UFC, because that's a winnable fight for Chandler. Um, guy who, you know, he's probably not going to hit you with a short double leg because you're a D1 wrestler or whatever. And even though you only have a right hand, uh, he, he still really struggles with being overwhelmed by aggression. Because this is what Michael Chandler's doing this week. I've mentioned it on both the previous podcasts. I was like, oh, the old Michael Chandler trick of pretending you're going to go to the UFC when you want to uh, renegotiate your contract with Bellator. And then he does that this weekend and people were tweeting me constantly. And the funniest part is people coming out and being like, yeah, so that's good business. And you're like, well, yeah, no, that's, that's true. But the press and us, we don't have to pretend that he is going to go to the UFC. We all know he's not. He doesn't want anything to do with a better fighters and be drug testing and i say that as a man who should love him because he's one of uh i think he's neil melanson's like main uh student at the moment nikita krilov versus johnny walker was sad uh it was it was just lame really lame you were like oh surely these two will uh have a meme filled fight and then they just you know krilov leaned on him Walker was dreadful, but Krilov was still sloppy enough that he managed to fail takedowns and pull Walker on top of him and almost blow it at several points. I mean, this and the main event was just sort of like a reminder that going to TriStar is not going to fix all your problems. As much as Faraz is an amazing coach and has produced some great fighters, you know, they it's kind of like people used to be back in the day, go to Jackson Wink. You know, that was the, the answer to anything. Camp change, go to Jackson Wink. Uh, which, you know, is, is the fans' answer for everything. The fighters' answer for everything is change weight class. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, there's only so much you can do with a ch whatever charge is brought to you. And there are going to be different gyms appropriate for different fighters. Now, after this, obviously, everyone was like, Johnny Walker's trash. He's, he's not even good at one thing. But there are coaches that could make good of what Johnny Walker's got. I would send him to Cordero, maybe. You know, one of those camps that has uh, success teaching strikers who are a little bit wilder, but more aggressive. But then, you know, Cordero is becoming like the one size fits all. Send everyone to him answer now. But yeah, you know, send him to one of those camps that isn't going to look for such a polished, clean performance out of a guy who just isn't a polished, clean fighter. And I think this applies to the Kevin Lee thing, too. You know, you can't reinvent yourself in three to six months. It just doesn't happen. Um, what you can do is find people who can make the best of what you're good at while also trying to build up what you're not good at in the background. 
but you're not going to become a wrestle boxer slash jiu-jitsu savant overnight just because you go to a good gym where they train a lot of jiu-jitsu slash jabbing. <laughs> uh, Trinaldo versus John McDacy was super boring. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun, but then I remembered, oh, John McDacy hasn't been in, in, in an interesting fight in quite a while. Since he had his jaw broken, really. Like, he's just been sort of um, tedious. Zaleski versus Konchenko was also boring. Um, Zaleski was doing, like, short snappy kicks to the, either the inside of the lead leg or to the body and coming down with a quick one, too. Konchenko just didn't get going fast enough. Um, Brandon Moreno versus Juicia Formiga. Man, I'm surprised for, uh, Moreno won that, actually. I was expecting Formiga to get the decision, or he did in my mind after watching it. Um, but it was a good fight. I thought Brandon Moreno did very well, keeping off a very savvy, dangerous grappler. And you just saw what GCF Formiga does to everyone. You know, it's like every position, every takedown he attempts, he's... Like, the takedown is secondary. He actually wants you to stop the takedown so he can pop out on your back. Uh, he did a great one from... A, well, he did a couple of great ones from that single leg he picks up. There was a really... <laughs> interesting one where he picked up the single leg and they hopped around for a bit and then the momentum stopped and you're looking at it going okay well that's where it gets hard you're just p holding the guy's leg up and it's tiring on you on your back you know and uh these are the w w we'll talk more about this later but like uh you know it's it's hard to finish any takedown once the momentum stopped and holding up a single just just sucks really and uh then he like turns away a little bit and then he comes back and basically you know, in wrestling, it'd be like clubbing the head and pulling the knee. Uh, Frankie Edgar used to do it loads, too, uh, to finish that little uh, post-single pickup he used to do. But Formiga basically clotheslines the dude with his forearm and sends him to that. It was awesome, but lots of cool moments in this one. Used the half Nelson to um, work from one hook and stop Moreno coming up onto him, take them out. Uh, threaten the power half. The power half's becoming a huge thing in jiu-jitsu, you know... Um, Gordon Ryan uses it just constantly to take the back. You get one hook in, you get the power half on the other side. Power half is like half Nelson, so one arm under the opponent's arm from the back. Like you're going for a full Nelson, basically, but just with one arm. But then it links with the other arm, which goes across the back of the neck, and you just crank their head down so you can pull them over into the back take. Um, in fact, that you know, Gordon Ryan is doing all these stupid like mixed rules things against wrestlers at the moment. Well, just, you know, to draw attention to the sport, really. But uh, he got... He lost a technical decision or whatever in 50 seconds to this wrestler, and then they had a grappling match, and Gordon Ryan just kept putting him in the power half and pulling him into back control. And the guy tapped, and Gordon Ryan's like, can't tap to that, it's not submission, it's power half. But it does suck, the power half being put in it. But half Nelson was what uh, Formiga was using here instead. But let's jump to Hani Yaya versus Enrique Barzola, which was a majority draw, and I wrote an article exclusively about this fight not about anything else on the card, wrote an article, put it up on thefightprimer.com. Go read it. It's not a Patreon Boy special. It's just for everyone. I know you're all bored because there's coronavirus shutting down everything. But I called it uh, Hani Aya MMA grappling for stubborn old bastards. Because <laughs> put this in perspective, Rani Yaya was in the ADCC where Eddie Bravo beat Hoyda Gracie. He was in their division. That's 2003. How old is that dude? I mean, he's only 35, but he's been around for ever but we talked about this in the article like Rani Aya hits a lot of head outside singles slash high crotches you know it's a very awkward takedown you're ex you're exposing your back to the opponent you know he, he has a lot less work in fact what I said in the article was and this links in with um Juicy F Omega's single legs the single leg the traditional single leg with the head inside or the head on the chest is um you know your opponent's response to that is mainly about undoing your control what uh ray carson a uh, great wrestling coach who wrote some great books he called it counter control you know you're just taking away bits of control and freeing yourself one step at a time and you can watch that guys pick up the single the opponent either like sticks their post their head on their head you know goes over hook wrist control often starts freeing the leg you know starting the motorcycle kicking the leg away put the leg to the outside of the opponent's legs or inside rather so it's not between their legs uh, and, and you just, you make, you, you take a little bit away each time and you make it just less and less favourable for them to hold onto that leg or more difficult for them to do that. And then, you know, you might drag them into a clinch or you might try and snap them down afterwards. But it's all about defending the single and then getting back to zero, basically. Uh, with the high crotch, the problem is that most of the opponent's reactions are uh, direct counterattacks. You know, it's it's either working for you or you're in trouble you know there's not that they're not taking away your control they're just trying to get to your back or attack the guillotine or hit the switch uh which is you know just get into the back really but it's a different way uh the crucifix is a, a real threat from the 
high crotch. But I mean, the main one is the guillotine. That's the one that everyone worries about in MMA and grappling. Um, and, you know, if you if you do the crackdown finish, which is, you know, that you can do a high crotch and you can change off to other things. So you can do a high crotch, change off to a double. Uh, you can do a high crotch and use it almost like a single. You can come up to a single, which Yaya did at several points. Uh, you know, if you watch Daniel Cormier, he just whips people. He grabs the high crotch and he just whips people around by it. And and that's his answer to, you know, that's his solution to not letting them try and counter him. He just keeps them moving and throws them around. But the crackdown finish is where you, like, run the pipe, but with your head on the outside. So if you've picked up their left leg and your head is on the outside, you bring them down to their left hip. And if you, you know, if you watch like Jake Shields, he bounces his own head off the mat every time he does it. But in that position, you have got them down. It's a really good way to get guys down. It works really well, even against fairly, you know, strong opponents. Uh, you know, I, I've always enjoyed using it in wrestling practice. But the danger is once you're there, you have to go back to zero before you start again. So you watch guys like Jake Shields and Yaya, they back up to in front of the opponent's guard. Like they put themselves back in full guard where you would think you want to continue passing because you're like half past already. But your arm is across their center line. You're exposing your back. Um, you know, there's the real threat of them popping out on that. And like I said in the article, and I showed some pictures, Gordon Ryan actually went from a crucifix. He pulled the opponent into a crackdown position, uh, basically giving them a, a position where they were the attacker and then transitioned to the back to score points at uh, ADCC uh, last year. But yeah, yeah, he was doing an amazing thing. Loved it. He was entering deep half all the time, which was great, which he can do from his head outside single too. Um, you know, he'll sit up from his butt, grab the head outside single, pull them on top of him, make sure the knee goes to his uh, to the opposite side of the knee cut and then swing into the deep half. But what he was doing that I loved was going to the reverse half, which is where you go deep half. And then the opponents often, um, you know, if you're grappling experienced grapplers, they'll try and jump over your head. They'll pop their knee over your head and sit down on the far side so that they're in... Uh, reverse half guard you know that sort of back sitting position we we talked about in the filthy casuals guide to marcelo garcia but nowadays uh, especially in gi jiu-jitsu guys will put you in that position they'll go to deep half and then pop your leg over uh, pop you over their head so that you're sitting on the far side and then some guys are really good at bridging up into you and sweeping from there so all the sweeps from reverse half um tend to be like bridging sweeps because you the opponent's back is facing in the direction that you're bridging so you're bridging and putting them to your back whereas in like a more traditional half guard position they're facing towards your head so you can't just bridge them overhead but you know uh yaya had a lot of trouble sweeping from there because bozola is a very strong top player um but what he was able to do was every time he went to the deep half there'd be a moment where bozola was able to like hammer fist him while his head was under his legs or under his crotch rather um, which is what everyone said was like the big weakness of deep half guard anyway, and has said for a long time in MMA. But then Yaya would pop his head out and uh, wrap his hands around Barzola's waist. And in that reverse half guard position, Barzola couldn't hit him in the head at all. Like he's hammer fisting his hip. You know, he can't get anything good. Uh, and then if Barzola tried to like, he got tired of it and he tried to like um, tripod, you know, lift himself up and free his knee. And he basically dragged uh, Yaya into a takedown attempt. It's a really interesting position, um, and the only answer that Barzola really had to it was in the late third round. He used the Kimura, and uh, Yaya rolled himself so that the Kimura was on the mat so that he couldn't do the Kimura, and opened his legs while he was doing it, and then Barzola jumped on the knee bar. And then I was watching the 2003 match with eight, uh, with Leo Vieira, and it, almost the same thing happens, not from the reverse half, but just from the regular half. Uh, you know, Kimura, Yaya rolls to his side, opens his legs to do so, Leo Vieira jumps on the knee bar doesn't finish it though and i think that's part of what makes the ir so special you know he's put he puts himself in these positions where he's in danger of a counter but he knows the counter really well and he you know he just knows the ins and outs of the position that he's working and that's how you get good at anything you know should average lad in mma gym or bjj gym be trying to uh, use the head outside single and pair it with the deep half guard probably not but if they want to make that like their specialty and really devote the time to it, you know, look at Hadi Yaya. He's still doing it at 35 years old and with a thousand fights on the uh, record. So if you haven't read that article, go read that article because it's got all the stills and gifts and things that demonstrate what I'm talking about. And his side control escapes were, were pretty cool too. He'd go to like an empty half, which is where if the opponent's in side control on your right side, you throw your right leg over their right leg and it's kind of a shit position, doesn't really do much. But what the opponent will do is like, uh, turn their hips and, and like knee slide out of it. But Yaya, uh, Yaya would throw his leg over like he was going to try some empty half guard bollocks and then he'd immediately bridge and go to his knees in the other direction. So, you know, he was absolutely knackered by round three and he was still doing a great job of surviving just by being crafty. And I really, that you know, 
while that might not be the most impressive thing on the card because you've got Charles Oliveira on there, I, that is still the thing that I kind of care most about in martial arts. How can you make the most out of what you've got when you're rapidly fading or you're slowing down or you're at a strength disadvantage? So I thought that was very cool. And then everything else on the card is just, you know, don't really care. So I'm going to um, call it a day in a minute. But before we go, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you can do um you know, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are, are actively training and enjoying martial arts and things. And obviously, that's one of the things that's going to be hit hardest by um, coronavirus, especially, you know, like wrestling and stuff, which I was sort of, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. But I was getting very uncomfortable about, you know, smashing my face into other people's chests and then going home to my wife or visiting elderly relatives and friends. So, you know, most places have now closed. The jiu-jitsu community has actually been really good about this. And, you know, obviously, whenever you bring this up, someone's going to be like, well, that's not an entirely altruistic move. And you're like, well, no, because you won't hear about anything that's actually done with no motive, that's just done charitably with no motive, because it won't be spread. You know, what has been done, which is awesome, is that um, BJJ Fanatics, Bernardo Faria owns that. And I've told you, I might have told this story before, but I went to... Marcelo Garcia's uh when was this like five ten years ago sometime between the last five and 15 years I visited Marcelo Garcia's in New York just dropped in and I went to the changing rooms and someone's stuff was piled behind the door and I accidentally knocked it across the room and I was like whoops I'm so sorry this gigantic dude is like he's no problem no problem uh really lovely guy and I'm just like I'm so sorry for knocking your stuff over the room uh Humblest guy in the world, despite clearly being gigantic and pretty jacked. Uh, and then go out on the mats and he's teaching one of the classes. Uh, and then later I find out, oh, that's Bernardo Faria. And he went on to win like a, a world title at heavyweight. And I think he, in the gi and then no gi. I can't remember, but very, very good. And really like, especially very, very good because he was very good at two specific things, you know. And this is what I love. People are just like specialists in weird shit. Bernardo Faria was really good at the deep half guard, uh, especially what he called like a shallow deep half or a half deep half uh, and passing the gi under the leg and using bridge sweeps like that. And that sort of inspires some of these reverse half guard players now who use bridging sweeps. And he was really, really good at over under passing, which if you have like a guy of his size, putting their shoulder down through your diaphragm the entire time very quickly drains you. Like, you don't see a lot of it in MMA. Uh, in fact, Kevin Lee is one of the few guys who really does underpassing in MMA. Um, but it, I think it'd be really interesting to see guys use the over-under in MMA because you can grind the shit out of someone with the over-under pass. But anyway, Bernardo Faria, he has since opened up a company called BJJ Fanatics. And um, he's done a load of instructionals for them. And, you know, some of them are like fundamentals and things like that but they've done specific ones like four dvd set on over under passing four dvd set on uh half guard in fact i think he did two different sets on both of those and then a nogi set on each so there's a lot to, to go through but he's giving uh he's put out a coupon code for a 77 dollar discount on 77 dollar dvd so you just you download the instructional for free um i think it's faria free all caps but, you know, you can just look up BJJ Fanatics on Facebook or Twitter to find that code. Um, and like, you know, that is a really high level content um, instruction and content for nothing. You know, and, and as much as that isn't entirely altruistic because they get attention from it, that's really, really cool. And then to, you know, not to be topped, John Danaher called up uh, Bernardo Ferrer and said, let's record a, a solo drilling DVD, which, you know, there aren't a lot of... There's not a lot of direction in solo drilling anyway in jiu-jitsu. There's, uh, you know, Andre Galvao, Galvao wrote a book called Drill to Win, which had some interesting ones in, but mainly was like two-person drills. Um, so to have like John Danaher, John Danaher come out and say, cool, I'm going to do this uh, DVD on solo drilling. Awesome. And that again is free. You can go to BJJ Fanatics and you don't even need a coupon code. It's just zero dollars. Uh, and then do Dijitsu, who are another big producer of uh, jiu-jitsu DVDs. They have put 30 of their instructionals up for free that you can just go get uh, at the request of the instructors themselves, which is awesome. Um, so, you know, if you want to do that, go and get... Um, I don't think there is a limit on, like, which ones you can download. I think you can just get all of them. It's not like a, a coupon code. But I would highly advise you to go and get Paul Schreiner's stuff now. Uh, there's a couple that are just, like, free short courses advertising his, um, you know, his newer DVDs. But his precision passing is there in full for free. Uh, and I think there's a Tarzis Humphreys one on there too. He's brilliant. So yeah, can't recommend that stuff enough. 
And I think Kaiotera is doing two weeks free on his website. Yeah, but if you hear about any more of those, please send them my way. I, I love that stuff. It's really um, interesting and encouraging, you know, because like we're going to rip off what Dana has said now. But like, you know, if you're not rolling, it's a good time to up your cardio, maybe do some strength training if you have access to weights and uh, acquire knowledge, which you can then use when you get back on the mats. In terms like people have been asking me about striking stuff. Um, I don't know if there's any like free striking stuff you know, any DVDs or anything that's been put online for free, I'll, I'll look into it. But someone asked me what they should get to, to work on. And I said, get something weird like Born to be Strongest, which was a Kyokushin uh, set of DVDs. I think you can get them online for, you know, at various places. You can probably torrent them, but uh, they're really good fun. They just br- they brought in like all the top competitors in various knockdown karate styles and said, like, what are your favorite few techniques? And they just show them off and they're all really weird and different. And I've, I've talked about Lucian Carbin's tapes before, they're good fun. If you're bored and looking for something to read, you can probably find the, the Sabaki Method online, which is a really fun knockdown karate style book. Muay Thai Unleashed by um, the Victory Belt guys, that's, that's a good one. How to Be an Ass Whipping Boxer is a classic by uh, Champ Thomas, I think you can find that online somewhere. I finally acquired a paper copy like two months ago. And if you're feeling really weird, you know, you've got things like Kung Lee's San Xiao. And of course, you know, I'm going to be putting up some stuff too. In the meantime, we know this, this Don Cruz Garbrandt study has grown out of control. Uh, it was supposed to be a short piece, became longer than the Anderson Silver and Bada Harry pieces. But, you know, it'll go up for the Patreon boys. Uh, I just did the Hanny Yaya piece for everyone. Um, and I'm just going to keep putting out podcasts to keep people busy. You know, there, there might not be a lot changing, but I'm going to be watching some old fights, uh, reminiscing, chatting bollocks, and uh, yeah, just going to keep putting out content. So if you want to support that, jump in on the Patreon. If you want to send an uh, email to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com, and those are going to be pretty important in the coming weeks, I can guarantee. Um, and if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Stay safe, don't do anything stupid. And make sure to keep doing things. There's nothing worse for depression or um, just your mind generally than sitting around doing nothing or reflecting on doing nothing. So try and get out there. Go for walks in the woods and shit. You aren't going to catch coronavirus walking in the woods. Anyway, I'm your boy Jack Slack. Charles Oliveira's Silicon Valley makeover. Bless.